Rebuilding a Burnack Vulcan model steam toy. This is part 24. Removing the completed boiler from the acid bath. Cleaning it using a toothbrush and plenty of clean water. Polishing the boiler barrel using my polishing spindle and cleaning up the silver solder just below the cap. Followed by more polishing and fitting the water gauge. This is my acid bath in the outer part of the workshop. The boiler's been in here for a couple of days because the acid is only weak. Here I'm removing the boiler from the dark recesses of the acid bath. It's looking quite clean now, most of the scale has gone. There's just a residue covering the boiler. This needs cleaning off first. And also, I need to rinse the inside of the boiler to make sure that the acid disappears from within. The substance I use as an acid in my acid bath is Kilrock K Kettle Descaler. I notice that the boiler is covered in like a red oxide layer, almost like rust, but it's not rust. I think it's something to do with the type of acid that I'm using, maybe, I don't know. But it's soon removed by using a toothbrush as shown here. It looks like some of the silver solder has run down the side, but it's not stuck to the barrel because there was no flux present in this area when I was soldering it. And during the cleanup operation, this piece of silver solder fell off anyway. Owing to the substantial construction of the boiler top cap, the ring of silver solder around the edge of the cap shows the level of penetration of the silver solder from inside the cap. I'm giving this area a special clean using my polishing spindle so I can inspect the condition of the fillet of silver solder around the cap. The original Burnat Vulcan boiler was made from very thin material and soft soldered. This one is so utterly over the top for the working pressure it's going to be running at. By thoroughly cleaning the silver soldered joint using this method, it shows how homogeneous it is. And yes, it looks okay, but it needs a bit of a clean up in the lathe. More about that shortly. For many years, I've used this Brasso wadding stuff. It used to be called Duraglit, but whatever it's called, it works very well indeed. The wadding contains a solvent and an abrasive. Time now to clean up the fillet of silver solder between the top cap and the boiler. This is a very simple job. This is why I used a piece of phosphor bronze for the centre flue. This is clamped firmly in the three-jaw chuck of the Boxford lathe and a live centre is inside the boiler in the hole at the other end of the flue. The fillet of silver solder was cleaned up using a round needle file. In no time at all, the silver solder overflow that ran down from the top cap is looking very smooth. I didn't show the next part, I cleaned the entire boiler shell on the polishing spindle. And by the look of it, it still needs some more attention from the polishing spindle, but I think it will be okay. For the moment, I'm having a Brasso Wadding Marathon. This is really good stuff, it does clean brass and copper and silver very well. In reality though, I didn't use any brass in the construction of this boiler. It's gunmetal and phosphor bronze. And the outer shell, of course, is obviously copper. This polishing job was starting to get a bit tedious. I wondered if I could supercharge the operation. It's top tip time. When I'm cleaning up brass parts that I can't use the polishing spindle on or I can't get at with my fingers, I use tea cut on a cloth. I hold the cloth in the vise and rub the part up against the cloth which is soaked in tea cut. So what is tea cut? It's an abrasive cutting compound often used for cleaning paintwork on cars. As you've just seen, I poured some of it onto a piece of Brasso wadding, and apart from my hands getting very dirty, it did improve the time that it took to clean the boiler. I think it's time to mount the boiler shell to the boiler base. Really, these bolts should have been 5BA, not 4BA, but I wanted to use 4BA because this boiler shell is much more substantial than an original Burnack boiler shell. I don't know what sort of pressure this boiler would stand, but it's made from 16 gauge copper and as you've seen if you've been watching the series very thick top and bottom plates as well as the thick walled centre flue turned from a solid piece of bronze. With the boiler secured to the base it's time to fit the water gauge. These are a selection of copper shim washers used for fitting water gauges in the correct position. They are available in packs of assorted thickness and sizes from Blackgates Engineering. The address is on screen. I always use these things when I'm fitting water gauges. These are very small ones, 
the internal diameter is only 3 sixteenths of an inch, but they are available in most model engineering sizes. I've selected the thinnest shim washer that was in the pack, and here I'm doing a dummy run to see if it fits, and it actually fits perfectly. So, without any further ado, I'm going to fit this in place. But before I do that, I'm going to use some Loctite 542. This is a hydraulic thread sealant and it's really good stuff. I never get leaks on threads when I use it. And in my opinion, it is far better than PTFE tape for model applications. However, there is one drawback. If you get any of this on paint, it will remove it. And for that reason, as I apply the 542 to the water gauge's thread, I'm well away from the base and I'm not putting too much on so it doesn't run down onto the base. For the bottom water gauge fitting, I didn't even need to use a spanner. It was hand tight only. Luckily, being a keyboard player, I have a very strong grip and I got it into the right position by hand pressure only. This clip shows a shim washer fitted to the water gauge top fitting. I couldn't tighten this by hand, I had to improvise. First of all, I fitted a union nut on the end of the thread so it didn't get damaged. Then I used a second Barco spanner to rotate the first one. I much prefer to do it this way than to use a smaller spanner on the hexagon flats of the water gauge fitting. The jaws of a Barco adjustable spanner are much wider, and as they are such precision made items, I never round any nuts at all. Now it's time to fit the water gauge glass. I've shown this many times, but I'll go through it one more time. Push the water gauge glass through the top fitting and persuade a silicone o-ring to slide up the glass tube. Then fit the brass nut and semi-tighten it. This is to stop the glass from sliding down. Next you fit the brass nut first onto the piece of glass tubing, followed by the o-ring, and then slide the glass tube down into the bottom fitting. Some experts may be thinking, why am I fitting the water gauge before the hydraulic test? The reason for this is a water gauge should easily stand the pressure of a hydraulic test. At this stage, I'm only lightly tightening the nuts. You must never over tighten them. And you will notice that I'm not using a Barco spanner. This spanner conveniently fitted in place because the head of it is much smaller. And that's about it. The water gauge is installed and it's looking good. I will adjust the tightness of the water gauge nuts during the hydraulic test, but it's very important not to overdo this. That's it for now, as very shortly I'll be setting off for yet another radiotherapy session on my prostate. This is part 3 of 5. Stay safe, stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainstream Models website, and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.